guys in this last lecture um, of this series, we'll talk about airway clearance techniques. Now, um, these are techniques to mobilize secretions of any kind, mucus kind of being the big one. And again, um, there are some, con some conditions where this is a big issue. Again, cystic fibrosis, we talk about their high risk of infection. Again, it's a septic um, and structural dis disorder, you know, hallmarked by the, you know, uh, the, the large amounts of um, mucus produced. Uh, asthma, this could be an issue as well, too, if they've got, you know, issues of secretion. COPD, especially for the chronic bronchitis variety, um, bronchiectasis, some of an acute pulmonary condition like an ammonia. Um, this one is a mechanical ventilator. Mechanical ventilators, we find if they're on a ventilator for a long time, um, one can develop a ventilator-acquired pneumonia. Uh, the other is just by having pressurized air pushing into your lungs, and it's a positive pressure, um, which is not typical that you know our, our lungs experience. What it may do um, is you know cause blockages, right, or decreases mu mu uh, mucus flow out of the lung. So often. Uh, patients with uh, on a ventilator may have issues clearing mucus because there's just a lot of it, right? Or it builds up because of the positive pressure pushing into the airways. So not uncommon for patients on a vent to have issues of secretion. So just bear that in mind. And then uh, status post-surgery. Anyone who's had a surgery of any kind has been laying down for a little bit. Those lungs may be a little, little junk in it. Again, our goal generally with these secretion uh, techniques um, is to, again, mobilize that you know, that mucus um, up to our carina to be expectorated out of our lungs. Remember um, the mucus ileus escalator, you know, the, the terminal point is the carina. There are cough reflexes stimulated to mobilize that stuff out of the lungs or expectorate it. Um, and, uh, oh, another thing too about um, post-surgery surgical cases, remembering that if you're under general anesthesia, um, which can also happen, you know, if you're on a ventilator, you might be on, put on paralytics. Um, or a neuromuscular block um, that will impair the beating of the cilia. Um, so you can see buildup um, after post-surgical cases. For that reason as well, opioids are a big one. Um, and then patients with vent, sometimes those get paralyzed a little bit as well. So pressure and those things. Um, so assessment, you know, we're always looking you know, for improving SAO2 or SpO2 on oxygenation. There's a decreased respiratory rate, decreased or dyspnea. Does it resolve their pathological breath sound? Do their chest radiograph improve? Do we see improved lung volumes um, you know, following these techniques? And again, just thinking about some of the conditions we see, you know, bronchiectasis, you got this um, big mucus um, buildup there, bronchitis, you got you know, mucus buildup there, and CF, again, copious mucus buildup in, the, in those cases. So the first thing I want to touch on is postural drainage. Postural drainage therapy is designed to improve the mobilization of bronchial secretions and to normalize like lung volumes um, by using the effects of gravity and then external manipulation of the thorax, uh, which can include, um, you know, again, the postural drainage itself, but, you know, percussion and vibration uh, to the chest wall. Now, there are all these different techniques there, which really just involved by aligning the lungs in different positions, either head up or head down, uh, to help to help mobilize secretions in patients who've got buildup. Um, now, you know, postural drainage can be, can be one done for a single segment, can be done um, you know, or on multiple segments. Um, you should be holding patients, if we're doing this, should be held in those uh, positions for three to 15 minutes. Um, and we can modify them. So there's a bunch of different ones we have here for each separate lung segment, um, but there can you know, be modifications made because there's some patients who may not be able to tolerate head down um, or sideline. So you can modify things um, you know, as you need, or just use a very basic approach, just head down or flat if we want to get the posterior segments, you know, head up if we want, you know, on our back, um, you know, if we want to do the anterior segments. So there's different ways we can kind of facilitate drainage um, in a very basic sense without getting too deep into the weeds of these quarter turns you often see. So um, these are things you might see in the board exam, um, but I'm not going to spend too much time going over specifics because, again, you can get by with just, you know, if we hear, you know, or suspect congestion in, you know, the, you know, the left side, for example, right, we want to lay on the right side so the left side is, fa is facing up so we have the effects of gravity to drain here. We have, we suspect congestion on the right side, lay the patient on the left side so we have the effects of gravity draining down, right? If we suspect that there is issues with the 
um, posterior sides, the labrum and the stomach. So we have the effect of gravity, you know, flowing down. Um, now, like I mentioned, sometimes you can just you can get by just with positioning. Uh, other things you can do is is percussing. So percussing involves using your hand or maybe even a little suction cup and then rhythmically striking um, the chest wall um, over the areas we suspect that there is a consolidation or um, some sort of buildup of, of mucus. Um, your hands like, should be kind of cupped, almost like the Miss America wave, um, and your cup and you're striking the leg to create a cupping sound. So if you hear like you're slapping, that's not the technique. The technique is you hear a cupping noise. Um, now, your wrist should be acting like a whip, right? It should be kind of loose, and this is kind of firm. The motion really comes from your shoulder, um, and your wrist acts like a whip, okay? Now, the problem is uh, with this, and we'll get into that, like the, you know, it could take up to 30 to 40 minutes if you got, you know, if you're trying to treat all the lung segments, right? Um, so you may see this reference. This is what percussion is. Uh, manual vibration um, is a similar technique. This is using vibration. Um, so basically you're doing an isometric contraction as the patient breathes in. We're contracting, uh, or so, pardon me. We're contracting through expiration. So as the patient breathes in, and then begins to breathe out, we exert a downward pressure while isometrically contracting, can creating a vibration on the chest wall. Um, again, these are typically done in conjunction with postural drainage, and these you know, vibration or percussion basically just help facilitate, in theory, the mobilization of secretions um, using techniques. And again, three to five minutes per segment. Now, there are some uh, potential complications uh, that can come from uh, these techniques, right? So, um, you know, hypoxemia, increased intracranial pressure, hypotension, um, you know, pain and injury. It's not super pleasant to do this over patients. Um, vomiting, aspiration, especially with the head down positions. Um, bronchospasm, if you hit the lungs enough, or sorry, hit the chest wall enough, it can cause the lungs to kind of spasm up, to seize. So it, sometimes we can almost create, you know, more problems. Um, actually, you know, this is back in 1991, I think the, uh, one of the respiratory societies out there put out guidelines. And even in 1991, there were some questions about the effectiveness of these techniques for uh, most patients, saying that it was kind of more based on tradition and anecdotal report than on scientific evidence. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and it's also been used quite often in patients who probably isn't indicated. Um, you know, patients who have, like, you know, could probably, we can do other things for. So... Uh, just something to bear in mind that we've been talking about the limitations of these techniques for about 30 years. Um, now, there are some contraindications. Again, these are there. Anyone who's probably not stable or really has significant respiratory compromise probably not going to do these techniques um, or anyone who's just not going to tolerate these positions. Um, now, you know, the Trinellenberg positions, really anyone that's got issues with their head down um, that you want to just be aware of here. So intracranial pressures, they can't you know, go above that. A descended abdomen or at risk for um, a um, aspiration. These are things you don't want people in a, in a head down position for any reason. So the issues with brain perfusion, you know, intracranial perf perfusion, or maybe even with their eyes, if they have issues with that, um, or um, you know, issues that we're concerned about an aspiration. Um, now, there are some other contraindications specifically to vibration and percussion. A lot of it has to do with, again, you know, we're going to be kind of beating on the chest wall. You know, if they're at a risk for having a you know, lung contusion or if they're osteoporotic or they've got some sort of irritation or damage to the ribcage, probably not a good idea to be beating on it. Um, so just kind of, you know, you know, bear that in mind. There's some contraindications to that. Um, and then indications, right? So, um, you know, the reason why we would decide to continue to do these techniques, right? If we see sputum production increase, we get more out of the lungs. Um, if we see their breath sounds improve, if we see that they respond well to the therapy, they just, just feel, say they feel good. Um, do their vital signs get better? Does their respiratory rate come down? Does pulse ox go up? Um, does their chest X-ray get cleared up? Um, do their blood gases improve or oxygen saturation? 
Um, and are, are their vent settings better right now? Are they maybe requiring less PEEP or requiring less oxygen, different things like that. Now, um, again, the evidence for these techniques isn't really great. You know, it really is not that great for non-cystic fibrosis populations. Um, despite the fact that, you know, for many years this was considered to be kind of common, um, especially in certain parts of the world. Uh, in fact, and I'll read this just kind of from um, a, 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 uh, the Respiratory Care Journal um, in, in a bit, but there's been evidence looking at this for, um, you know, chest PT treatments, which these were often called, um, you know, percussion and postural drainage for pneumonia, um, for COPD, um, even for children with pneumonia, like it's the evidence, it doesn't really support it versus maybe just getting up and getting the people moving around and take deep breaths. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the other side is, you know, if you, if you look at the technique, um, no one does this consistently. Um, you know, even people who do it often. So it makes you wonder like, you know, is this, if, if we're, if our techniques are so arbitrary, you know, our, our technique performance is arbitrary, um, you know, makes you wonder, you know, is this actually, you know, valid? The other concern is, um, you know, there, there's people even question, are we even able to, uh, per, to, to percuss the ribs at the frequency needed to mobilize secretions, which is a, it's a fair question because, you know, are we able to keep a consistent beat, beating rate, um, despite maybe fatigue, despite maybe just, you know, our inability to keep things consistent as humans, beat per beat. Um, so again, there's been some questions like, are we, you know, is our technique even standardized? Um, is it even possible to do these things? And then there's a statement that came out in respiratory care, which stated that, you know, you know routine delivery of, of airway clearing te techniques, notably, um, chest PT, hospitalized patients is common. How the, you know, the burden of, uh, delivering prophylactic, P you know, of prophylactic airway clearance techniques like chest PT, um, you know, you're, you're, we're looking at again, for these techniques can take a lot of time. They come from an era when patients were in the hospital for long periods of time. Um, so for a non-cystic fibrosis population, which is not something, you know, it's, it's a, that's not a population that every PT treats, um, you know, there are, you know, concerns like, is this enough? Do we have enough time to do this? Um, and again, it's a dependent intervention. It's a passive intervention. It's not something the patient's doing themselves. You, know, you can't do chest PT on yourself. Maybe you can do postural drainage, but if you need to be monitored, right? Because if we're concerned, maybe an aspiration, like, there's some concerns about that, right? So um, there, you know, there, again, there's a lot of evidence out there that supports probably not much better than other things that we can do. What does have good evidence, however, though, are these. So for patients, and again, you know, the, the, there are populations that do require routine airway clearance like every day and cystic fibrosis, one of the biggest ones, right? Um, so again, the disadvantage of chest PT is that you need someone else to do it for you. And again, if and for cystic fibrosis, where you are probably percussing all the lung segments to keep them clear, um, or a lot of them, that takes time. And you're gonna do that maybe multiple times per day to keep those lungs clear. That's just hard to do for parents and uh, kids can't do it themselves. So what has been developed now are these oscillating vests that kind of do this themselves. So basically the way it works is people um, hook up a vest that has pressure, air pressure moving into it and it beats along the chest. Um, so it basically replaces the chest PT, the vibration techniques that you know a, a person would do with a, with a vest. The great thing is the kids can hook, it up, hook them up themselves, they're kind of simple to use. Problem is they're kind of expensive. Um, there are multiple foundations out there that uh, parents, you know, rent from or buy an older unit for their kids. Um, you know, they're they're sized differently. So sometimes, like someone who's older, you know, you know, donates an, uh, uh, one they use as a kid that people can borrow or purchase. Um, and you know, the advantage again, these kids can use them. You know, they can hook them up themselves, and then and, and that is the biggest thing. And someone who has issues like cystic fibrosis with airway clearance and needs, you know, pulmonary hygiene routinely, anything that you know, they can do independently is going to facilitate that because they don't have to wait on someone else. They can be as compliant as possible. It's independent. They don't have to wait on someone else. Um, so um, very, very, very efficacious for patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, now, 
they're often applied in combination with a nebulizer treatment to, for bronchodilators. Again, because you're beating on the chest wall, you can get that bronchiospasm. And they're often given mucolytics to really help you know, decrease the viscosity of the secretion to get them out effectively um, after we've been mobilizing them. Um, so you may see this used in the hospital as well um, in patients um, who've got issues with, with you know, acutely with secretions as well. But cystic fibrosis is probably the big population where we see these used. Now, um, for most people, um, there are other techniques we can use as well. So I'm a big fan of these, these oscillating post excretory pressure devices. These basically operate by uh, the patient breathes out through these devices, which has a little ball oscillator in there, which creates vibrations that um, get transmitted back into the airway, um, which help vibrate and uh, dislodge mucus. Again, um, you know, it's all done by the vibration in these devices that gets sent back into the airways with a little bit of back pressure, um, a little bit of resistance because you're breathing into this tube, um, and that helps mobilize secretion and you have to cough them out. Um, they do it 10 to 12 times and then perform a huff cough or just a regular cough to clear uh, junk out of their lungs. There's multiple different types of these OPEP devices, oscillating po positive excretory pressure devices. Um, the great thing about this, these are independent. Like again, you purchase a device for yourself, um, you know, or you have issues with you know, airway clearance, you can do this on your own. So often, you know, sometimes patients with cystic fibrosis are given these too, um, you know, or anyone with you know, concerns of airway clearance, because again, it's independent, it's active. They don't have to, you know, they're not laying down waiting on someone else. And again, if, if we're concerned about airway clearance, an independent therapy and someone who can do this independently is always going to be better because they don't have to wait for someone else. And it's, again, think about resource allocation for your, for your staff. You don't have to be there either. You know, so you don't have to allocate 30 minutes of a PT just doing chest therapy um, in a hospital, right? Or, or in, a, in an outpatient setting. The patient can do it themselves. Um, another technique you might see is the active cycle of breathing technique. We'll do a video on this one for you guys to review. Uh, basically, what this uh, what this does is the patient breathes um, using a series of maneuvers to help mobilize secretions by um, oscillating or changing their um, tidal volumes, right? So they go by um, uh, a pattern here. So they start by taking three normal breaths, followed by three deep breaths, and they repeat that three times. Anytime we take, you know, we change tidal volumes or increase them, decrease them, it'll help mobilize secretions. Actually, one of the effective me measures for of why exercise can be really great for airway clearance. We'll get into that later. Um, so the patient does this cycle of three, so three normal breaths, three deep breaths, three times, and at the end, they finish with a coughing technique. Now, it could be a huff cough, could be a normal cough. Um, I like this technique. It's super easy to learn. Rule of three, three normal breaths, followed by three deep breaths, repeat that three times, and then cough. Um, it's uh, There's other techniques out there you might see, autogenic drainage, which uses similar things, you know, varying tidal volumes, which I think can get a little complicated. So I prefer teaching patients this one. Again, independent, it's active, they can take ownership, maintain their agency and their independence in doing something that's really important to them with keeping their airways clean. So I'm a big fan of the active cycle of breathing. Um, another technique you can utilize is again, inspiratory holds. So again, that's um, yeah, a technique to put a little back pressure in the lungs. Basically what this is, is the patient holds in a breath at the end of inspiration. The idea is you can put a little bit of back pressure, open those airways up, stretch those type two alveolar cells, kind of clean, you know, open things up a little bit. Um, you can do this in patients with an, who may have a limited inspiratory capacity, they can't take a big volume in by using a, a stacking breath technique. So basically what they do is they take little sips of air in without exhaling. So if someone who can't just take a big breath in, they can take little sips on top of each other until they fill their lungs um, and then maybe follow that with a cough. So again, technique that we can utilize, put a little bit of stretch, um, you know, put a little bit of um, you know, pressure to open up those airways and mobilize those secretions. So similar to our ventilatory techniques, we can, we can combine these. We can do an inspiratory hold at the end of active cycle of breathing. We can do it prior to using an OPEP device. We can do it, um, you know, prior to a lot of different techniques, right? Um, but you know, so you can combine these if, if you like as well. Um, again, just going over the mechanics of coughing. Um, so 
Again, coughing requires a really you know big volume in, which is why a lot of people who have um, you know issues ventilating have problems with coughing, um, and it requires abdominal control and contraction, right? So if you have issues, maybe bringing volume in, you know, that inspiratory hold or stacking breath technique can be effective. Um, but maybe if you have pain, maybe you've got an abdominal incision, right? You can't really like, you know, contract your abdomen super well. Like, what can I do? Because again, the forces that come out from coughing can be kind of high and can kind of hurt. So a technique we can utilize is a huff cough. So a huff cough, um, basically what people do, so instead of coughing with a closed glottis or a closed throat, the mouth and the throat are open. So it's like they're coughing, but they're not, <coughs> they're, Right, a little bit different, a little bit less strenuous on the abdominal muscles. So people who have got abdominal pain, they can do this. Maybe you give them a pillow to do that while they're doing that. Again, you can stack those, those ventilatory techniques, an airway clearance technique to make it more tolerable for your patient. You can do it after an airway clearance technique, or this just can be a technique patients use um, you know, you know, when they cough, right, without those techniques. So you can, you can combine these techniques um, we're going to educate your patients on how to do these things to, to meet whatever whatever needs you have. So I'm a big fan of these for patients maybe after surgery to decrease the pain because, again, we want patients to take deep breaths. We want them to be coughing and clearing their lungs. So this is a way to decrease the pain so we can allow them to accomplish that task. So huff cough. We have a video of that on our, um, on our course page. Now there's also assisted cough. So again, we can mention maybe you know we have can have an issue of pain with with coughing, so we can use a huff cough. However, there may be patients who don't have have, have an issue with abdominal muscle contraction because they don't have abdominal tone um, at all. So like a patient with a you know, quadriplegia, right, or a high spinal cord injury. Remember we talked about patients, but maybe with a you know a cervical um, lesion. You know if it's above you know, or below C5, right? They still have C5, C through C3, they still have their phrenic nerve, they can take a volume in, but they don't have any thoracic roots, so they have no abdominal tone. So while they can breathe, they might not be able to cough effectively. So there are th techniques that can help patients do this. Um, assisted coughs or quad coughs, basically patients um, cough and you provide a little bit of extra pressure um, as they um, you know, cough. So the idea is you're just providing that little extra positive pressure that would normally be, you know, um, accomplished by them contracting their abdominals, but they don't have it. So you're providing that for them. Um, you're, you're, you're replacing the role of their abdominal muscle because they don't have any tone. Uh, can be kind of uncomfortable, even though if they maybe have a motor incomplete or sensory incomplete. So you might want to use a towel or a pillow to make it a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit less uncomfortable. And then the last technique we'll, we'll cover is, um, or, or one of these kind of independent techniques is uh, incentive spirometry. The idea with these techniques, uh, incentive spirometry, is to expand the chest wall. Uh, so this can be great for preventing maybe um, atelectasis or treating it or mobilizing secretions. Uh, these are typically used in patients who can't take deep breaths or are not super active, like there's someone in the hospital. Um, so what they do is they take a deep breath um, out, breath out, breathe all the way out, and then they breathe in slowly through this device. And as they breathe in, this little plunger will rise, and we usually give them a goal, I want you to get to maybe a 1,000 liters, and then we'll see as well in this chamber, a little ball or a little plunger also elevate. That represents the flow rate. The key for this, patients should be breathing in slowly. We don't want them to take a big burst in. It should be a slow In, really encouraging recruitment of all of those alveoli, slowing things down, full breaths in, not just a quick burst in, okay? And that's what you often see patients will breathe, it'll, this thing will jump, and that's not what we're trying to do, a slow, deep breaths in. And then a hold for a couple seconds, do an inventory hold, put a little bit more stretch on those alveoli, so keep those lungs inflated. Um, and typically the rule of thumb is patients do this 10 to 15 times every hour if they're in the hospital. Again, the thought process is, is if you're in the hospital, you're not taking normal deep breaths, you're not super active, you're at risk for atelectasis. Um, so this can be a way to help maybe prevent that. Now the evidence for this getting also in question if this is actually effective or not. Again, maybe it's just, it's just an anecdote passed on from history. Um, you know, My thoughts are not the worst thing in the world. 
not a bad thing, um, you know, to, to, to try. Um, probably the best thing, though, for patients is to get them active in exercise. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, last thing we'll spend some time on is talking about tracheal um, suctioning. So quite frequently, PT interventions will mobilize pulmonary secretions. Um, so tracheal suctioning may be you know, required to remove secretions from the upper airway um, is someone who's on a trach. Uh, maybe even prior or afterwards, right? You might notice this. So uh, this is a sterile procedure. So you're going to need eye protection, a mask, sterile gloves, um, sh you know, should be should be used because you're getting your suctioning uh, direct port into their lungs. Um, so uh, just be mindful of that. Now, this is not something that, you know, in, in, I would even say is entry-level practice. You may see this. Um, you really got to kind of know what you're doing with the vent. Um, you know, with these patients. So it's something you may, you know, you may get exposed to in your clinical experience. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, a technique that you, you may see used just because PT interventions, again, you're going to be, you're going to be moving secretions. You may be the first person um, into the room that day um, to help, you know, clean them out. So the, the more we can get those, the, that junk out of their lungs, the better. Now, there is a set procedure here. Um, again, you're going to check vital signs, make sure the, you know, equipment's working. Note the ventilator setters, noting the FiO2. Always check with the medical staff, um, explain what you're doing to the patient, put your mask on, attach suction to your suction tubing, discontinue the patient from the oxygen source. This is why not really entry-level practice because you're, you're disconnecting them from their source to suction them. Um, and so it's always really good to make sure they're adequately oxygenated prior to performing with stable vital signs because if they're not stable, you're disconnecting them from the oxygen to suction, you could cause some very serious problems. So it, you really got to know what you're doing um, in, in the vent um, before doing this. Um, patient's going to, you're going to use a, a resuscitator bag to kind of mobilize the secretions. You're going to increase, the, they're going to insert the, the catheter until you feel resistance, which is usually the carina. Um, and then you're going to apply suction while withdrawing in the catheter a few, few centimeters after feeling resistance. So you're going to insert it all the way in until you feel a, a stoppage. Pull it back a little bit, apply suction, and then remove it um, by turning it counterclockwise. Um, and then suction should be continuous, um, and you're rotating it out as you're removing it. Okay, um, and you may do this, you know, a few cycles to kind of you know clear all the gunk out. But always making sure that you're keeping the SpO2 consistent, and maybe even increasing the FiO2 after each insertion. Um, so uh, you may also suction them out at the end as well. So. Uh, again, this is not something I would even consider as entry-level technique. PTs do do this. You'll see this more on, especially in PTs in uh, other countries. Quite often, respiratory therapists take care of this in the United States. However, if you are in a critical care unit working with patients on a vent, you might, you're going to be mobilizing the secretions. You're going to need how to know how to do it. Um, so you might you might you might be asked to do it um, in certain settings. Um, so just be mindful of that. Again. You really gotta know what you're doing with the vent setting to do this with a patient. Um, so just be, you know, it's not something I recommend, you know, even students or even entry level therapists doing this without extensive experience in the ICU. Um, now, probably the biggest thing for airway clearance is just exercise. We know exercise is gonna increase ventilation, we'll take bigger tidal volumes, we'll have variable tidal volumes, which really can be great for mobilizing secretions. Um, you know, airflow will change. We'll have bronchodilation because we'll have a sympathetic response. Chest wall will be moving around. Um, even just maybe the vibrations from us banging our feet as we run, you know, the, the GRF that, pro that propels through the body are all are going to move secretions. That's kind of, I mean, kind of why anyone who's had a, a minor chest cold, you go for a run, you get all kinds of stuff flowing out of your nose, coughing up as you run, like it can be very effective. So the best airway clearance technique I say for a patient who's independent, has good cough function, get them moving I'm out of bed, you know, get those lungs expanded, you know, get that junk out of the lungs. If they can't um, move too well, there are active independent techniques that we can do. The OPEP, active cycle of breathing, maybe using some inspiratory holds um, that we can utilize. You know, if uh, they can't do that, then yeah, maybe a passive technique would be good. I'd say if we're really concerned about, you know, airway hygiene, you use a vest. Um, if you don't have access to a vest, if you don't have access um, you know, but, you know, to, um, with other devices, then maybe use some of those postural or passive techniques. It's not the first line treatment for patients, um, especially more independent patients. So, uh, that was airway clearance in a nutshell, and, uh, that will wrap up our week of lecture. So thanks so much guys for tuning in.